Ecclesiastes said for all this I laid in my heart even to make clear all this for the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hands of God whether it be love or hatred we knoweth it not all events come alike unto all there is one event to the righteous and to the wicked as is the good so is the sinner and this is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, I returned and I saw that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither bread to the wise, nor riches to people of understanding, but time and chance happeneth to us all. For we know not our time. As the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, even so are we snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon us. When I applied my heart to know wisdom, then I beheld all the work of God, that we cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though we labored to seek it, we shall not find it. Yea, further, though the wise think that they know it, never shall they understand it. You know, friends, life is a mystery. And death is a mystery, too. None of us ever asks to be born. We know not when the final moment will come. And even between those two parentheses of our being, we cannot account for all of the forces that change us and that shape us and that mold the vicissitudes of our existences. We are not the ultimate arbiters of all meaning and purpose in this world. We begin as dust, and in the final analysis, we end as dust, and we are not privy to the ultimate secrets. Not now, and not ever. 
Marvin Hamlish is gone from this world, and he is gone much beyond his time. Many are his plans unfulfilled and his dreams unrealized. He leaves his loved ones sad and bereaved on a lonely way. Their hearts grieve for him, and our hearts grieve for him and for them. Their loss is a profound one. Dear friends, this is not the world of justice, but it is the world of love. It is only through love that we can endure. It is our saving power. But today there is a somber melody that plays in our hearts and echoes with these walls of our sanctuary, the very same sanctuary where George Gershwin's funeral was held on July the 11th, 1937. The Holy One leads us in sad paths. The choir now gives a rendition.
we have gathered here this morning not because Marvin Hamlish died, but because Marvin Hamlish lived. Let this service be a celebration of his extraordinary life as much as it is a collective expression of grief at his tragic and untimely passing. There is a story told in the Talmud. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, one of the great sages of 2,000 years ago, one day called in his finest disciples and gave them an extraordinary charge. He said to them, go out, leave these halls of academia, go into the villages, into the marketplaces, observe people, and come back and tell me what is the single most important quality for a person to have in this world? The disciples went out, they mingled, they observed, they trickled back. Rabbi Eliezer said, Ayan Tova, a good outlook. If you have a good outlook on life, you have everything. Rabbi Yossi said, Shachain Tov, a good neighbor, to have a good neighbor, to be a good neighbor. That's the essence of life. Rabbi Yoshua said, Chaver Tov, a good companion. And finally, Rabbi Elazar, the son of Arach, himself destined to be one of the great sages of the next generation, returned and said two simple monosyllabic Hebrew words, Leif Tov, a good heart. The elderly Rabbi Yochanan stroked his long white beard and smiled. And after a lengthy pause, he said, each of you has done well. But if I must choose one answer, I would select that of Rabbi Elazar, the son of Harach, who said a good heart, because his answer subsumes each of yours. I and Tova, a good outlook. Marvin had a wonderful outlook on life. He enjoyed life. He was always turned on. There are times we'd be alone, and I would say to him, Marvin, relax, you're not performing now. It's just the two of us. And he would look at me as if to say, this is how I relax. I shall arrogate to the other speakers the task of recounting his many achievements and his many awards which he received justfully. Suffice to say, when I first met Marvin, he was 15 years old. His mother said, this is my son Marvin. Someday he'll be the greatest composer in Hollywood. At the time, it sounded like hubris. In retrospect, I must say, she underestimated him. <laughs> he became the greatest composer in Hollywood and on Broadway, as well as a great pianist, conductor, and performer. And yet, for all of his greatness, he remained close to, dare I use the phrase, the common people. There was one time we'd gone to an exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum. And while we were admiring the works of art, two matronly women with southern dialects called me over and said, when you're alone with Mr. Hamlish, please tell him how very much we appreciate his music. And I said, oh, would you like to meet him? Marvin, come here, you have two fans. He came over, he chatted with them, he signed their programs, he made their day. For them, it was an extraordinary moment. For Marvin, it was typical. Many years ago, I read an article about an Indian tribe in Patagonia, in the Argentine, that has a very rich native language with very beautiful idioms. And in this Patagonian language, when one takes leave of a very, very dear friend, he doesn't just say goodbye or see you around. He says, 
I like myself better when I am with you. Marvin had that quality. You didn't just enjoy him. You liked yourself better when you were with him. That is a beautiful outlook on life. Shechein Tov, a good neighbor. This world is a better place because Marvin was in it. His sense of humor was all-encompassing, as was his musical talent. The story is told in the Talmud of a great rabbi of the third century, Rabbi Barachia, who one day is in the marketplace and he meets Elijah the prophet. The fact that Elijah had been dead for a thousand years didn't throw him. He knew that Elijah walks the earth, that Elijah knows past, present, and future. So Rabbi Barachia asked Elijah, who is there here who will be my roommate in the world to come? Elijah points to a street entertainer, a juggler, a comedian. Rabbi Barachia is taken aback and says, a clown? I am the greatest scholar of the age. I shall spend eternity with a clown? What has he done to deserve that great honor? And Elijah the prophet said, he makes people laugh. It can be said of Marvin, he made people laugh. He was extraordinarily generous, not just in obvious ways, but in little ways. Whenever we would visit him, we had to be very careful to refrain from admiring something too enthusiastically. He would insist on giving it to us, not because he didn't want it, because he wanted to make us happy. He tutored many young musicians without charge. It wasn't a professional thing. It was because he loved people and loved music. And whenever one of his students would become famous, and several did, Marvin regarded the individual as a dear colleague and never as a competitor. Shachain Tov, he was a quintessential good neighbor. Chaver Tov, a good companion. As he loves all humanity, Marvin had a profound love for his wife, Terry. The story of how they fell in love and then met is more romantic than any work of fiction I've ever encountered. But what is even more beautiful than how he fell in love is how he grew in love. His love for Terry intensified as it matured. I remember how very proud he was recently when he would phone us and tell us that Terry was awarded a research grant of academic nature, how he rejoiced in her achievements as much as in his own. Marvin was very much of a family man. He had been exceedingly close to his late parents and to his beloved sister of blessed memory. He remained close to Terry's family, to his nephew David, who is with us today, and to his cousins, and our children, and our grandchildren. He would usually manage to find time in his extraordinarily hectic schedule to share the Passover Seder or High Holy Day services with us. Whenever he would give a concert in a city where any of his cousins happened to live, he would provide us with tickets, of course, and then take us backstage afterwards to meet some of the other performers and introduce us proudly as his family. We will always treasure the memory of the time when Marvin took us to Washington, D.C. for a concert at the White House 
and sat us in the front row, just two seats away from President and Mrs. Reagan. He was nonpartisan. It's okay. <laughs> he was a chavertov. He was a loving companion. And finally came Rabbi Elazar, the son of Arach, who said, Leiv Tov, a good heart. There is a Yiddish idiom which defies translation. We say of a very special person, he is a good Tanishama. A lexicon will tell you it means a good soul. No. It means infinitely more than that. It is a sublime existential concept. It means someone whose very essence is goodness. We do not use this term lightly. Marvin was ultimately a good Tanishama. That is why he was so universally beloved during his all too brief lifetime. And that is why he will be so profoundly missed. A century ago, the great Hebrew poet Chaim Nachman Bialik, anticipating his own premature death, wrote his own eulogy. It is as valid at this moment as it was then. After my death, mourn me thus. There was a man, and see, he is no more. Before his time, his life was ended, and the song of his life was broken. Oh, he had one more melody, and now that melody is lost forever lost forever. Speaking now, the most personally meaningful words of memorial tribute are those who knew him the best and loved him the most, beginning with President William Jefferson Clinton. Rabbis, Terry, family and friends. First, I thank you for giving me the chance to celebrate and give thanks for the life of a great giving genius. He gave us all the gift of our memories, and we remember him in different ways, which is why I could sense all over almost the relief when the choir began to sing, because everyone then was free to celebrate his remarkable life through their own memories. Genius is rare enough, but a good-hearted genius is rarer still. A good-hearted, humble, and hilarious genius, almost unheard of. My own memories of Marvin come from the fact that he liked to say yes more than no. And I can't tell you how many times over the last two decades he said yes to Hillary or to me, not just in campaigns, but in the State Department, the White House, the work of my foundation. He always knew that his gift could empower other people and touch hundreds of thousands, even millions of people because of what he did, often in a small room, wearing just a sport coat, sitting a couple of feet away from
from not the grand audiences that give you Oscars and Emmys and Tonys and Pulitzer Prizes, but just people stunned and happy and calm to see this funny, giving genius. In his memoir, The Way I Was, he said, uh, and all the press quoted this, which I thought was great, that uh, his highly demanding father said, Marvin, when Gerson was your age, he had a concerto, where's your concerto? <laughs> we are Marvin's concerto. We are grateful that he was given to us for 30 more years than George Gershwin. And we are grateful to be small notes in a remarkable symphony. So now, the final movement of his great symphony, the way I was, is clearly nobody did it better. do it again. That's it. No one. No imi imitators and descendants aren't the same. No one. My name is William Mitchell, and I am very honored to be here today. When I was a teenager blasting the music from a chorus line on an old stereo as my parents kept yelling, turn that down, I never thought I would meet the Marvin Hamlish. When my daughter was two years old and I was dancing her around our living room as the one singular sensation, I never thought I would meet the Marvin Hamlish the Marvin Hamlish who wrote the music that peppered our lives and forced us to feel. Who hasn't cried these last few days hearing the bittersweet emotion in the notes of the way we were? Marvin once told me that the lyrics to If He Really Knew Me resonated with him. Does the man make the music or does the music make this man? Marvin loved his music and he was generous with it. He wanted to share it with the world. Just last week, he was eager to find out how his new show, The Nutty Professor, was received by the public. And of course, like a proud papa, he was excited to hear the good news. It's a hit. And as many here can attest, Marvin was not only generous with his music, but with a kindness and caring. Marvin was always there for you in good times and bad. He gave selflessly. He never asked for anything in return. He gave so much. How could I ever say thank you for a lifetime of memories. How is that even possible? I will play his music for the rest of my life and ponder the fleeting moment of knowing the Marvin Hamlish. My name is Ebes Bruno, and I'm first going to read a statement from Mrs. Nancy, First Lady Nancy Reagan, uh, followed by a statement from President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama. Mrs. Reagan said, Marvin Hamlish was my dear friend, and I am truly stunned by his death at such a young age. I heard him say once that he was old-fashioned, and I suppose that's why Ronnie and I were so drawn to him. But I don't think you could ever find a more contemporary and talented musician. During our time at the White House, he entertained at many events. He even let me sing with him a few times. 
but luckily, his piano music drowned out my voice. And I'll never forget that he wrote a special song for Ronnie's surprise 77th birthday party in 1988. My heart goes out to Terry at this difficult time. To Terry. We were deeply saddened to learn of Marvin's passing. Please accept our heartfelt condolences as you mourn his loss and reflect upon his extraordinary life. Marvin used his remarkable gifts to enrich the lives of countless Americans, and his music forever changed the landscape of our imaginations. A tireless advocate for arts education, he reminded us all that the arts have the power to shape our lives and change our shared future. We know he will be dearly missed, and we hope fond memories of your time spent together will temper the grief you must feel. Please know you and your loved ones are in our thoughts and prayers. You know, it's, I must say, I am thrilled that it is a packed house because that is what Marvin would want. And it's only fitting that our Marv, the, the people's composer, would elicit such an outpouring of love and respect from heads of state, first families, captains of industry, dancers, singers, composers, baseball legends, and everyone around the globe who loves music. Only Marvin could bring all of us together. He always knew that the music was the great common denominator. Regardless of where you live, or what you do, or how you vote, it's the music that we all share in common. Knowing Marvin was to know generosity of spirit and soul. And whether I was calling him to ask if he would conduct the National Symphony Orchestra for the first Obama State Dinner, or whether I was calling him to ask him, should I live on the Upper East Side or the Upper West Side? <laughs> when I was moving back to New York, or the number of conversations that we had about arts and education and how to design a new 21st century, um, you know, in performance at the White House program. Marvin was always on the other line or across the table, and he always answered his own phone. And he was always there guiding my every step and move when it came to a show, when it came to performer, but when it came to every aspect of what do I do next and my future, he was my biggest cheerleader and I his greatest admirer. To know him was, of course, to love him. And while I learned so much from him, my greatest prayer is that every morning when I wake up for the rest of my life, I attempt to go through my day with the optimism, joy, and genuine belief in the good nature of all people that Marvin had. I will miss you more than words can express, my friend. But thank you for all you gave me and the world. Thank you, Mr. President, for your kind words. And I just got a text from Hillary, too, so please thank her. <laughs> I'd like to point out something first, that today's choir is no ordinary choir. What started out a small, simple choir grew by the day and formed by already invited guest and musical colleagues. His peers have chosen to sing in this choir 
to honor Marvin. It's filled with renowned composers like Sheldon Harnick. It has singers like Lucy Arnaz. It has stellar orchestrators like Jonathan Tunick and lyricists like Rupert Holmes. Marvin would be so pleased to be honored by his esteemed peers in this way. Thank you, Judy Clerman, for this amazing gift. My name is Terry Blair Hamlish. In the last several days, as in the last 26 years, I have learned just how right Marvin Hamlish was in so much. In our home, when I admitted he was right about something, he would affectionately and jokingly say, could you say that louder, please? <laughs> when he left to score the movie Liberace, he said, I know my talents, and it's not that I think I'm irreplaceable, but I do sort of have an experience and a voice to add to this project that is unique. Well, Marvin, you were wrong. You are not replaceable, and the world is saying it loudly now. You were a genius, a giant in your field, and as a human being. Quoting your friend Michael Keller, the world is dimmer and a lot less funny without you. There is a poverty of adjectives in expressing our sorrow for the loss of Marvin Hamlish. There was only one Marvin Hamlish in the world. Marvin taught me how to live life with gusto and magic. He would order every dessert on the menu so everyone could taste everything and miss nothing in life. His friend Lily gave him a luncheon in France, and it was a luncheon that was only desserts. <laughs> he dug into those desserts like he did life. With fearless abandon and unbridled joy and enthusiasm, his life force was huge. I, on the other hand, am more cautious by nature. He took my hand, and he led me into his world of magic, where even the mundane became electrified with his humor, joy, laughter, and brilliant insight. I remember when I would become totally confounded over an idea or behavior of his, and my good friend Jason Epstein at the time would say calmly, Terry, you married a real bona fide genius not a salesman, it's a different skill set. <laughs> and he would quietly list the characteristics of genius to help me understand the childlike enthusiasm, the rarefied creativity, and of course, the quick, brilliant mind. Marvin was the most loyal and supportive friend imaginable. I don't know people like this. If I was sad or discouraged, or had one of life's curves balls hit me, Marvin would jump on top of the bed much before, uh, much before I would prefer to wake up, mind you, and perform an entire musical complete with lyrics and choreography and the dancing chorus, playing all the parts himself to the disbelief of myself and our dogs. <laughs> but he always got me to laugh my way out of it. Marvin did the same for his close friend, Liza. Liza, he loved you so. When they were young, on subways, going to auditions, he would belt out in song to Liza, you'll be swell, you'll be great, from Gypsy to cheer her up. Marvin's generosity was unparalleled by anyone I have ever met or seen. If your child needed a doctor, he was there to help. He performed for families with terminally ill members, friends, and the ailing lady next door. Marvin worked to keep arts in impoverished school systems. Regardless the need, he always said to me, I wonder if anyone realizes I never say no. He never said no, he was there, and he kept giving. 
And this is important. He never told people all that he did. He did not brag. He did not boast. He was down to earth and never thought he was better than anyone else. Even at Campbell's funeral home, the stories that people told me in the last days, where it was his premiere and his friend was choking and he went out in the middle of the premiere and got him water and walked him out in the hall to make sure he was okay. As a human being, his character was beyond great. He mentored thousands and thousands of young people and never boasted and never bragged. So, so much that no one ever knew that was true humility. Humility is such an interesting quality to have in this world today and often overlooked, misinterpreted, and underappreciated, but a quality of a giant character. Marvin lived by his mother's Bambi rule. When I would fly off about someone's petty injustice, he would quote, if you don't have anything nice to say about someone, don't say anything at all. He lived by that and saw the best in everyone. He had deep, wise compassion and understanding for their behavior and tons of forgiveness and love. Marvin loved deeply, was sensitive, and passionate. His passion for music, especially for the theater, was who he was. But he also had a boundless love and passion for his beloved Yankees and for his dear close friend, Joe Torre. He used to have the Yankee scores whispered to him by someone strolling on stage right as he was performing. <laughs> That's until he found this gizmo he bought that he could put on the conductor's stand. I thought I always sensed a bit more enthusiastic movement and rhapsody if the Yankees were winning, <laughs> but maybe that was just me. Marvin said music is the universal language that brings people together. After receiving thousands and thousands of emails from Japan, Australia, Italy, England, Switzerland, Canada, Sweden, Korea, Germany, Austria, Israel, and more, I know that what he believed and said was not idle rhetoric. The world is mourning the loss of Marvin Hamlish. When I was a student at SIT, the School for International Training, my fellow students were from the worst war-torn countries, Afghanistan, the Sudan, Darfur, Iraq. And do you know what Marvin did? He hired buses. And he bused all of my friends to see the musical Fela. He was always doing something for someone else. As the genius process goes, sometimes he would write things that some people did not get right away. And he'd say, it's OK, Terry. I will be known as the people's composer. Because I will make music accessible to the millions. Marvin saved cultural institutions, his leadership, vision, and contagious personality and enthusiasm from the stage transformed symphonies, symphonies that are in very difficult financial circumstances, and audiences adored him. He increased the Pasadena Symphony pre-sales 200% and had unprecedented sales. He saved cultural institutions, therefore continuing culture in our country. I liked the card on the Pasadena Symphony's flowers. It said, Marvin, was genius with genuine. It was just to be announced this week that he would be the Philadelphia musical director, Pops. He had so many things he was looking forward to. His friend Jay Stein says he was the Steve Jobs of his industry. He started early and ended early, but he changed lives. Marvin had this quote hanging in front of his desk, which he looked at every day. It's a quote from His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. It says, the true meaning of life. We are visitors on this planet. 
We are here for 90 or 100 years at the most. During that period, we must try to do something good, something useful with our lives. If you contribute to other people's happiness, you will find the true goal, the true meaning of life. You did that, honey. You were so much greater than you ever thought. How fortunate we all are in a time, in our time, that you came our way. How incredibly lucky and grateful and honored and humbled I was to share 26 years with you. Thank you from the depths of my heart. I love you, Marvin, and I always will. Just like it said on our wedding napkins, forever and after that. Thank you. Thank you for all of us. Daddy always thought that he married beneath him That's what he said, that's what he said When he proposed, he informed my mother He was probably our very last chance And though she was 22 Though she was 22 Though she was 22 She married him 
life with my dad wasn't ever a picnic, more like a calm as you are. When I was five, I remember my mother, dog earrings out of the car. I knew that they weren't hers, but it wasn't something you'd want to discuss. He wasn't warm. Well, not to her. Well, not to us. But everything was beautiful at the back. It wasn't paradise, but it was home. Everything was beautiful at the ballet. Raise your arms and someone's always there. Everything was beautiful. I would love to at the ballet. Please rise for the memorial prayer. Shalom, 
על משכבו, ונאמר, O God, full of compassion, Thou who dwellest on high, Beneath the sheltering wings of thy presence, among the holy and the pure who shine on in the untroubled firmament of endless time, grant perfect rest unto the soul of thy son, Marvin Hamlish. Lord of all mercies, take him under the cover of thy wings and cause his soul to be bound up in the bonds of eternal life. Be thou forever his possession. May his repose always be peace. Amen.